OK, great. So the idea is it should not be the typical session where I talk to you. I want to hear questions from you guys. No matter, like every performance talk I've done, I always get people afterwards that tell me about their performance problems with their sites. And I think those are really interesting questions. And I really want to make a session out of that if we can. So I'm hoping that you all have questions. Um, I'll first introduce myself again. I'm a performance engineer at Acquia. Uh, that means I'm generally working on internal things. I deal with the performance related issues of all of our internal products. And then once in a while, I do some external stuff. And I do some performance work uh, in core. Now, there's a lot of talk about Drupal performance in the community. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, people talk about varnish, memcache, all these different things you can do to your site. Even little, like, we love to talk about code level things, like ternaries are slow and things like that. Um, I, I like to get the point across that none of that matters outside of the context of your site. So that, like these performance, like we always want to make a black and white thing out of performance. It's very, very, very rarely the case. I also want to get the point across that faster is not better. I see this attitude a lot. Um, let's just do it this way because it's faster. So why not? There's no harm in it. There is harm in it. There's always harm in it. Optimizations are not free. If you change one piece of code to do something else to optimize it to uh, make it faster, that will very, very commonly come at the cost of readability. So I always want to get points across that the um, that there's always a cost and to consider that cost and figure out is that cost worth it. And before I move on too, too far in here, I have some slides. I would love to never get to the rest of the slides. Um, I think I would like to start and see if anyone has questions or issues that they want to talk about. Yes. Yes, please. Very specific. Yeah. They're not better with Redis. Right. OK. I'm wondering if there's a comparison on Drupal, on MySQL security patches, which already in I love, I love this question. You just gave me everything that I wanted. Um, <laughs> to recap, you're making a site. You are testing the performance of it with JMeter and AB. Um, and you're using Redis for cache. And you're noticing that when you, your results from AB are actually slower with Redis enabled. Actually, I, I don't know if they're, they're not. OK, not a significant difference. difference. OK, that's fine. Um, and then you, I think the actual question was something about your query cache, right? OK, so let's talk a bit about um, how fast things are. Uh, we generally, it's just a general assumption that you don't use database for cache. Uh, memcache, Redis, it's always going to be faster. Faster doesn't really cover it. Um, yes, it's coming from memory. But if you say, if you're on a machine that has, uh, let's say you have MySQL local to that machine and there's no network overhead, I've seen instances where, I mean, you already have that database connection there. It can actually be faster to use database for cache instead of memcache in that environment. For writes, memcache or Redis will be significantly faster because you're writing to memory and you don't have to write to disk. In this scenario, you're not writing. You're only reading. So I'm actually not that surprised that you saw that. The other component to that is the biggest benefit I think you get from something like memcache or Redis is scalability versus performance. 
right? Like you're going to be able to scale that horizontally in a way that you can't MySQL. And so if you're just talking about one instance of that, I don't think what you found is really abnormal at all. I think that's probably expected. I would think so. Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, that, that's also a good reason why I don't, I don't actually benchmark or load test that often, especially with tools like that. Because if you're, I mean, if you're just trying to evaluate those different pieces of your stack, that can be a reasonable way to do it, but it's probably better to just profile it, and then you can see exactly how much time is spent where. Um, because when you say use something like AB, like in this case, you're testing the difference between Redis and Memcache, right? Okay, I said Memcache, I actually meant MySQL. So it's Redis and MySQL. Um, so you, those are the two things you want to test. When you use AB, you're testing those two things, plus PHP, plus everything else that happens on the request, plus Apache, plus the network overhead, DNS, like you're testing 20 things and you want to test one, right? If you profile it with something like XHProf, you can get in and look at exactly how much time was spent in cache get or cache set. And then you can know and you can compare those. Like XHProf has a thing where you can give it two runs and then compare the diff and then it'll tell you like this percent uh, difference over that. And generally, like when you do the AB J meter thing, it's more of like a scalability test. You want to verify that everything is working well. Um, it's very rare that I see issues there that I didn't see just looking at one single request. If that one single request looks good, you're probably gonna be okay. That later test, like the load test, is actually more of like an infrastructure test, just make sure like there isn't anything wrong. But I hope that's a common theme that we're gonna come back to that actually profiling is really all you need to do in most of these cases. Yes? To do what? Okay. Another. Yeah, that's another great question. Um, I don't, I mean, so there's the, the basic stuff. Um, well, I mean, you touched on measuring tools and like optimization type tools. Um, they're sort of the, go ahead. Yeah, um, I don't actually use many other tools than XHProf. That's like my main tools that I use. Um, I find um, finding finding bottlenecks and finding why a request is slow is all about tracking it down to the one single thing, right? If you start at anywhere else but profiling, it's very easy to get off onto the wrong track. So if you start, so say like a page is slow, I see this all the time. People look straight at the no, or the slow query log or they'll pull up InnoTop or MyTop. At that point, you haven't, you haven't figured out if it's even a MySQL issue or not. And so who knows what the hell it is. If you start with XHProf, you can see immediately, okay, I see a bunch of time spent in DB query or select PDO, whatever. Um, and then at least I can say, okay, now I know it's MySQL. Then the next step might be, okay, let's look at the slow query log. 90% of the time, it's just gonna be a query that's not indexed or that is creating a temp table, and it's gonna be really obvious what's, what's going on. Um, very, very rarely do I have to pull out like special tools like IOSTAT, like look at like actual like system level stuff. It's like, very rarely needed, um, at least in the work that I do. And so I would, I would always suggest just don't jump to those tools. Um, always start with profiling and then let that inform where you need to go next. Um, but in terms, I, mean, I think you did mention like opcode caches and stuff. Yeah, I mean APC is a requirement. Um, I don't, I don't profile sites unless they have APC on them. Monitoring. What kind of monitoring? So New Relic, uh, New Relic is cool. 
I've looked at it a little bit. It, so, like, w when I work on a site that already has it, it's sometimes useful to sort of start me looking in the right direction, but I almost always then still profile it with XHRA. Um, because the, the difference is, so there's two kinds of profilers, well, not really two kinds, but theirs is a sample profiler. And what that does is it basically like takes samples during the request and then it figures out, okay, well this, at this point I'm in this function or this function and then so your slowest functions are gonna be apparent because it's gonna catch those more often. Um, that's a really nice way to get like low overhead data and not add a lot of overhead to the request, but you don't get the full backtrace. I think you get a little bit of a backtrace with New Relic, but it's really confusing to me. Somebody might know it better and have more information. Uh, the really nice thing about XHROP is I get not an exact backtrace, but I get the entire request. So if I see, okay, all this time is spent in DB query, I can figure out where that came from. And in Drupal, we, also, we often have very, very long paths. And so I want to know where that came from. Or I want to be able to look at the data a different way and sort it a different way. Which it, sound, it seems like I'm uh, going to have to get into that and at least to show it. How many people here have used XHROP? Okay, so maybe I don't. All right, question? Yes. Yeah, I've been on one site with like the full, the full expensive plan, and I felt like like there was definitely more backtrace, but it wasn't quite the same. It's very possible that I just didn't know how to use it, because that's if I find it very confusing. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Okay, um, do you know, are you the only one on it? Okay, and again, just to repeat the question, the question was, you're on a virtualized instance, you don't run the hardware, it sounds like. Um, sometimes it's slow, sometimes it is uh, not slow, and you, need, you wanna be able to figure out when, or, or why it is, uh, without having direct access to the hardware. Um, Slow is an interesting term when talking about like the entire web server because most of the time when I find that, it's actually queuing. So say with PHP, no matter what version of PHP you're running, if you're running PHP FDM or if you're running mod PHP, you set a number of PHP processes that can handle your load, right? So on, say you're doing mod PHP, that's gonna be Apache's max client setting, right? And say you have 20 max clients. That means you can serve 20 people at a time the next person is gonna get queued. And then when one process uh, frees up, then that one's gonna serve them. If you get 60 people in, then you have peop then you're essentially your page time keeps getting multiplied exponentially by how many people are waiting in this queue. So that is, the, it's much harder to, to measure because I noticed most times when people think that something is slow, it's really just they don't have the resources to keep up with it, right? And having your page be faster will certainly help with that. But I would want to know how many how many processes you have. It's a pretty go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. No load. What gave you the imp what gave you the impression that the memory was an issue? Okay, so um, I mean, I think one way to prove that would just be to basically sh like profile a page 
at different times and show that the exact same thing with no load is very different. But I don't know how to do that with memory, but with CPU, you actually can look at that. Um, if you look at top, I, I, I can't pull it up here because the BSD top is really different. There's a parameter. Um, when you look at the percentage percentages, uh, you'll have to Google this, but one of the parameters is, I forget what it's called, but it's basically how much CPU is being stolen from that box. What, steal, is that what it's called? Yeah, what's what's the, there's like an abbreviation for it. XT, ST, ST. Look at the percentage of ST. If that's super high, your shit is getting stolen from you. So, but also it's, I mean, if, if ESX is anything like Zen or half those other, uh, VM platforms, most of those standard tools are lying to you anyways, so who the hell knows? Okay, question. Yes. It's always a good idea to use an SSD whenever you can. Um, but most of us do not have that luxury. Uh, even on AWS, we have SSDs, but it's an ephemeral. So you can run your database on ephemeral. You can also use MongoDB. <laughs> But lots of people like durability, so that's maybe not the best idea. But it's always always a good idea to, to use an SSD when you can. If you have real hardware, that's hugely helpful. Especially if you have a site where it's like you you have temp tables um, that you just can't get rid of, that's gonna be significantly improved by an SSD. Yeah, yeah, and if you have if you have hardware, definitely do that. Like if you're if you're bare metal, it's absolutely worth the investment for that. Totally agreed. Yes. Yeah, so, and I guess, um, so you're talking about the reverse proxy support in Drupal 6, reverse proxy support is in Pressflow. In 7, I mean, there isn't really much in Pressflow 7 um, because a lot of that is already in 7, so you don't actually need anything for 7. It works great with uh, reverse proxy. Um, but you went through a lot of different things there. So what are the requirements of this site? Because if you're talking about boost and you're talking about reverse proxies, it sounds like a large amount of anonymous traffic. Well, yeah, so, um, so the, the in terms of the anonymous traffic performance problem, it's more or less solved, right? So we have, I mean, page caching is already pretty good by itself. Um, varnish, reverse proxies, like actual CDNs, it's an order of magnitude even better than that, right? That's, a, that's an easy problem to solve. Um, but what you're talking about, you're talking about you have the need to possibly have one block that is either cached differently than the rest of the page uh, or be dynamic. That's actually an okay use case for ESI. Um, or, and I hate saying the word ESI because I don't actually mean it. Um, I mean that block being pulled in in some other way. So that, yes, absolutely. I much prefer the JavaScript uh, route because then you, you avoid the complexity of ESI and it works in your dev environment really simply. Um, when you, you can key the cache for that based on essentially whatever you want, depending on which module you use. Um, there's the ESI module, which Marcus back there, he wrote that. 
um, you can, it, Marcus, it does have like a hook where you can basically add any context you want that'll change the cache key for that. So if it's zip code, you could add the zip code to the cache key and then that would get cached by that region, right? Okay. So that's Drupal 7 only. Uh, if you're in Drupal 6 though, it just respects block cache rules, right? It respects block cache rules and in Drupal 6, I have a patch that's in the queue that lots of people don't like, but it's awesome. <laughs> it, <laughs> It provides, it's another hook in the function, I forget what it's called, it's the function that comes up with the cache ID for a block. Um, it's totally fixed, uh, you, you can't really add your own stuff, you have your own little, I mean nobody uses block cache because of this. Um, you can only do like by role, by user. Uh, that patch just adds a little hook in there to where you can implement that hook and in your, ho in, your, in your hook implementation you can say, if the block is this, here's another thing to add to the key. And then so you basically have all the flexibility you need for block caching um, with that one tiny core patch. Ah, uh, fuck if I know. Um, <laughs> it's, search, search for it, like, my, so my name M. Sonnebaum, block cache, and you will get, there's like, I have like three or four block cache issues. Because basically like block caching is a fantastic way to improve the performance of a site. Um, you just have to tweak it here and there. You just have to understand the limitations of it. Yes. Okay, so your question is, you're trying to use varnish, you're not getting any hits, uh, you claim that you're not using cookies or sessions. <laughs> All right. So the way to debug that is curl. Um, I mean, so you, can, you can debug what's in the VCL, but honestly, I think you, there's things to check before that. I can show you really quickly how I would go about that. So say, actually, window. So I know that say like aqua.com should be cached by varnish. Um, dash I, if anyone knows that curl flag, it's a head request. Um, it's not actually the most reliable thing to do because some VCLs might not actually work with head. Um, but it's still, if you want to be really sure you can do that, you can actually just force the message to get. But what a head request is, is it does a request that's like a get, but it only returns you the headers. It doesn't actually return you the body of the request. And so you can just run that. And then, so we have X Drupal cache miss. Who thinks that means uh, we had a varnish miss? All right, good. That doesn't mean, <laughs> that doesn't mean anything at all. Um, we have the things to look for cache control. My cache control is max age. Um, more than zero, that's one thing to look for. Um, and the magic thing here is this. Some, yeah, so we actually do have X cache hit here, and that means that it was a varnish hit, but that's a specific thing that we put in our VCL, right? So we have to put that in the VCL underscore hit, um, we, Send that header and then we also have an incremented counter so that we can see how many hits that page got. But that's not always reliable because that requires something in the VCL. This one is what you want to look at. If there's two numbers, it was a cache hit. If there's one, it was a miss. I forget the details exactly, but I'm pretty sure it's like one is like the hash for that request and then the other is the cache ID or the hash of the cached object that it served uh, in place of that. And so if that second one is not there, it is a miss. What now? What is it? Sure. Yeah, but the main things you want to look at are max age, uh, whether it's private or public, which I mean all those are usually, if you're coming from Drupal, they're all going to be in sync. It's either going to be max age zero or max age not zero. And as long as you don't see a set cookie um, header, then you're fine. But even if you think you're not using sessions or cookies or anything, check it. Just make sure. I've seen many cases where that is actually happening. 
you do this. If, if, it was, if you were setting a cookie, it would, it, there would be a cookie that says set cookie, and there would be a cookie after it. Yeah, I wish I had a way to check that, but I don't know that I do. I don't know of a site offhand that I could do that with. But yeah, curl dash i, wonderful. Okay, next question. Yes. Um, no. Because so the question is, do I do I do I have a preference uh, on web servers? Do I use one or the other? Um, I don't really care because web servers are almost never a Drupal bottleneck, right? There's all kinds of benchmarks out there. You can have people talking about how much faster Nginx is than Apache. I can, I can almost guarantee you that it's not your bottleneck. So you can implement, like you can throw away your Apache and implement Nginx, and you can add complexity to your setup, especially if like maybe your team doesn't know Nginx, it may not do any good for you at all. Instead, you actually just made everything more complex. Um, Nginx is a fantastic web server. It's great. Um, it's a great load balancer. It does a lot of things that are, I mean, it's like say we, we run Nginx as a load balancer, but we still run Apache um, as a web server because it's just not our bottleneck. Now, I, the, the issue is a little different if you have mod PHP because mod PHP is going to use more memory because that means every process, every Apache process has an entire copy of the PHP runtime. And that can be an issue as long as you're not, so if you serve a static request, if you serve CSS with that, then you're gonna use way more memory to do that. So if you have mod PHP, make sure you have a reverse proxy. So that make sure that you're always serving your static assets from something like Varnish, and then it's a wash. Um, somebody say something? Yeah, uh, yeah it, that doesn't really matter. It's just saying, um, it's just not giving it, it's using the max age header instead of uh, working with the expires header. Generally, that's a better uh, header to send than expires. Because it doesn't really matter when that thing expires, it only matters how long it's good for. But yeah, that's Teresa's birthday. And there's actually a better answer to that. I just forget what it is. Is that what it is? Wh yep. That's right. Yeah, and that, yeah, that's why there, I mean, HTTP, there's like three or four different headers that actually control everything. But what we are generally going to be pay, paying attention to in modern implementations is cache control. So the question is, if you have a, if you have a setup where you have multiple web servers, and how do you deal with the issue of bringing up a new one and it taking a while to warm up? I question what you mean by warm up. Um, because there's, there's warming caches, right? Which is probably, I think, what you're talking about. APC would definitely be a cache that needed to be warmed on a new web server. Um, that's gonna happen more or less instantly, the first request that comes in. Uh, there's, I mean, you could try to um, prime that, but I don't know that that's necessarily going to be a big issue. It might be an issue if you actually have an instance of your cache on that. Is that what you have? Like, like memcache? But shouldn't they all be talking to the same, say, like database and cache? Oh, NFS. So I mean, I think the issue here is that it's heavily dependent on the setup. I think in the ideal scenario, this wouldn't be an issue um, because your only client cache should be APC. Um, are you running your files, like your PHP files off NFS? Okay, I'm gonna recommend not doing that if you can help it. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, yeah. I mean, that's, that's not ideal for a lot of reasons, um, which I, I don't know if it's useful to go into past, if you have any choice at all, don't run PHP on NFS. Um, just use that for a browser directory. Yes. I don't know. Um, <laughs> all shared file systems are terrible, and they're all a pain in the ass. Run whatever you're comfortable with in terms of your team's capacity, uh, what you can support, and the amount of high availability your site truly needs. If you can get away with NFS as a shared file system, Awesome, do it. If you need to go into something like Gluster, it works, we run it. It's not without its issues. Um, unfortunately, we're stuck with this problem for a long time uh, because Drupal has a couple, I mean, uh, there's a few things in Drupal that are just very aware of a file system, like the image cache pattern where we check if a file exists and then if it's not, if it doesn't exist, then we create it. Um, we can't do the sort of the Heroku style thing where you don't, where you just don't have a shared file system and then you just use something like S3. We're not at the point where we can do that. I would love it if we could do that. But with things like Drupal 8's uh, PHP file storage, uh, it doesn't seem like we're, like there's too much interest in that. I have a feeling that both uh, we, Acquia Hosting and, and Pantheon are probably pretty interested in that um, because it is a pain point, but uh, Maybe it's just a pain point for us. But yeah, I mean, it's a good example of how like, it's a very, very much a pain point for us, but I think a lot of sites get by just fine with NFS. Just for your files directory, not for, not for your PHP file. But yeah, avoid shared file systems whenever possible. And just avoid, avoid behavior where you're dealing with a file system because file systems are so unpredictable. You never know what's like, if you think a, a stack is inexpensive, don't assume that. You never know what's going to happen depending on the file system that you're dealing with. Yes. Like to de debug why that's slow? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think that is a great. Yeah, I think that is a great segue into XHProf. Um, I'll just quickly demo that. So if you go to, um, so XHProf is a PHP extension. It was written by Facebook. Um, the extension itself just provides you with a handful of functions. The main ones are XHProf enable and disable. Uh, you start enable at the beginning of the request, and then when you disable it, it gives you a big ass array. And then the build, like the code that Facebook gives you just writes that to a serialized uh, PHP array in a file. And then they have a UI. This is the UI to look at it. Um, if you look at the session, the session page for this page, I have a gist at the bottom that shows like a very simple, uh, the simplest way I know to install the extension and to um, and how to enable uh, XHProf profiling on your site. There's also the XHProf module, which that'll do it as well. Um, but once you get that file, and then you can view it here. So let's look at. One of these. So, the first thing you get is the summary. Uh, can you guys read that? Okay. Okay. Th yeah, that's fine. Just that table. Just the terms here. Wall time is what we would just normally think of as time. Uh, CPU time is wall time minus I/O, and so like time spent in MySQL or memcache are not going to be reflected in there. Sometimes that's useful. Generally, you're just going to want to look at wall time, and then you have memory usage and number of function calls. It starts. Uh, I need to move that over there. Okay. It starts by de by sorting by inclusive wall time, and so inclusive wall time means to say inclusive for call user func array means how much time was spent in call user func array and every function it called, right? It's not surprising that that's at the top of this because that's the, the, like the basis of the Drupal hook system. So that doesn't really tell us much. Um, and then you're going to just go down and see all these things like panels, render, C tools. These are the things that are happening at the very top of the request. Um, I don't think this is a very easy way to start. I like to flip it and start with exclusive. 
So if you sort by exclusive wall time, now you see everything. Uh, so exclusive is only time spent in that function. So time spent in that function minus all of its children. In this case, uh, <laughs> this I know that this is a site that is Drupal 6 with a version of views before 6.2.11, I think, um, because of these stupid unpack options things. These no longer are there. If you ever see these, actually, no, regardless, if you have an old version of views 6.2, upgrade it, please. Um, because you can see this shit gets called a lot of times. Is array 121,000 times, right? Um, unserialize, and so when you look at it, actually, when you look at this, this time, uh, that's microseconds, so that's saying 1.17 seconds was spent in the unserialized function. That in itself isn't going to tell you much because it's like, well, I can't optimize the unserialized function. That might be your um, your first idea, but that's it's more interesting to think of what it's calling the, the unserialized function. So you click through to that, and then when you look at the function level view, you see this current function, all of its parents, and then you see its children, but this is a native PHP function, so there's no children. And then you look at the breakdown of the parent functions. So the percentage of, of the callees, uh, or the callers, are here. When you see this huge disparity here, like you go from 98% to zero, I ignore the rest, and I just immediately click through to that top parent, because that's already telling me all these unserializes are coming from cache git. Now, it might be interesting at that point to look at what's calling cache git so much. I think it's more telling if I look at the child functions. I see unserialized and I also see db query. And what that tells me is this site is using database cache. Because if it was using memcache, it wouldn't be calling. Well, it wouldn't be calling db query and it wouldn't be calling unserialized because it wouldn't have to, the memcache extension handles that for you. So at that point, I would probably stop and say, um, just change it to memcache. Although I, I'm not actually totally comfortable with that diagnosis at that point. But um, seeing the unserialized function take that much time is actually probably a result. My guess would be that this was profiled on the machine when it was maybe a little CPU bound because it still shouldn't have been that slow. XHProf does add some overhead to the request. It doesn't add as much as Xdebug, not nearly as much as Xdebug. But um, and yeah, if any of you use if any of you have used Xdebug to profile before, it's fine. If you look at like relative times, but it adds a lot of overhead. It doesn't do memory. I can't I can't think of a single reason to use it instead of XHProf. You should just use XHProf. Um, but then when you look at something like uh, like is array taking 100 like almost 140 milliseconds because it's getting called that many times, that's a little bit um, exaggerated because of the XHProf overhead because XHProf is going to add a little bit of overhead to each function call. And so very fast, small function calls, uh, that's going to add up in a way that it won't add up on function calls with a lot of I.O., if that makes some sense. But what I've found is the, I mean, I built a lot of tools around XHProf, like trying to make it easier. Like XHProf module makes it easy because it puts this whole UI within Drupal. Um, I don't use it just because it's a little slower. Um, and there's a, there's a JavaScript implementation I did at xhprof.io. Like you can just drag the file on, uh, but it only has the one level so far. Um, and there's actually, I'll put the slides up at the end. At the end, there's a link. I just made like a single page version of this UI, so it's even simpler to install. Um, but I think the trick is just trying. Like just doing it, getting some results out of it. Even if you have a hard time uh, reading this and getting something useful out of it, there are people that'll help with this. Like if you hit me up on IRC and show me that like I have this, but I don't know what to make of it, I'll probably help you. Um, but I know that many people just don't try because no one asks me. So <laughs> my, my, my thought is that people are just afraid to try. But it's really, in, in my opinion, if you're a developer and you've ever set up a debugger, you've already done something way more complex than set up this. And this is a, uh, sort of an essential tool. I actually use it for debugging because I can just see what called what. So yeah, XHProf is awesome. You all should use it. And that's really the only tool I use for that. Next question. Yes.
Yes. Um, so generally, the biggest performance issues you're going to see are I.O. related. Um, MySQL is there. It's going to be a popular one, mostly because of uh, unindexed queries and like queries that create temp tables. I hesitate to start with MySQL because I don't want people going straight to it until you see that. Um, but the other popular ones, like Drupal HTTP request, um, shell exec, stuff like that, anything that is um, anything that is I/O is basically going out and asking for something. Drupal HTTP request is a tough one because uh, it, it's a really horrible thing to do within a within a, a request that is serving a, s a, a page to a user, right? There are times when you need the results of that uh, HTTP request to create the page you're trying to make. And that's legitimate if you need to do that, maybe. Um, I would suggest if you can, move it to the front end. So like if people who were here last hour, Jeff talked about um, having like the consuming feeds uh, via JavaScript on the front end of a Drupal site, that's ideal. I would much rather do that because your browser can make requests in parallel, PHP cannot. So if you do that HTTP request and it takes you, I mean even the fastest HTTP request, you're still looking at probably 200 milliseconds if you're lucky, uh, probably more. Y your entire process is blocked until that comes back. So if you can avoid that, I absolutely would. The only, the only use case where I think that's, it's pretty justifiable to have it in the request is A, it is absolutely necessary to render the page and you need to hide credentials like you're making in a web services request that has credentials that can't be sent on the front end. In that case, there's not a lot you can do. But in the case where you need to make an HTTP request because something happened, like a user visited this page, they clicked something, they saved something, so now I know I need to say like post this response to, uh, to some web service, but it's not strictly necessary to return the next page, you should queue it. Uh, the Q API is the greatest thing in Drupal 7 that nobody uses. It's still in Drupal 8. There's like a, a wonderful backport to Drupal 6. It is a great way to take, I mean, it's basically the, it's the way in Drupal and PHP to process things in parallel, right? Because you can't do it, um, I mean, PHP is single-threaded. Uh, it can't actually do anything in parallel. But you can say, stick it in this queue and then have a Drush worker running that's just constantly processing those things. So it's similar to cron, but if it's in the Q API, you can just run it all the time. Um, you can run it every minute, or there's if you have if you have Redis or Beanstalk D, you can run a long running queue worker. That's actually just a long running Drush process. That as soon as something hits the queue, it processes it and, d and does it. That is my absolute favorite pattern. Um, I think it is a great way to uh, to offload tasks off of the UI, but it involves a little bit of complexity to set up. But it's worth learning. Absolutely worth learning. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna give you the real dumb version. Um, it's basically when MySQL has to do, when MySQL has to assemble results in a way um, to where it can't, it can't do say like the sort or, or the condition you need without creating a new denormalized table, either in memory or on disk um, to process that with. There are two parameters. I think it's like max heap table size. I, I'm probably screwing those up. There's two parameters or something like that that have to do with whether or not there's 32 megs by default. Um, if the data set is larger than that, it's going to stick it on disk. If not, it's going to do it in memory. Uh, memory is going to be significantly faster, but ideally you just want to try to figure out how to make the query without MySQL creating a temp table. Um, you'll know that it's creating a temp table by running explain. Has everyone run it? run explain on their MySQL queries before? Any MySQL query you have, you can put the word explain in front of it, and then MySQL will show you like the execution plan for it, and you can see at every step whether it's using an index, whether it needed to create a temp table, and how many rows return from each step. So say you have a query that's joining on the node table, and then like five other things, and the first step is the node table, and it says that first one returned like 100, 200,000 records, and then filtered from there, that's bad. You should not. You should try to figure out how to get it to not do that. It can be a, a tricky process making that happen because different versions of MySQL 
uh, the query parser works differently, um, and it's hard to predict what MySQL is actually going to do. Um, hopefully, you can you can save it with an index. If you can't save it with an index, and it's a view, be ready be ready to um, just rewrite it by hand. Yeah, th I think that's a general tip. If you are really fighting with like a query and views, don't be afraid. Like if, if it comes down to it, you're just gonna have to replace it with custom code. And that's and that's an okay thing to do. Yes. <laughs> Damn near never. Like I like I've been wanting to get into extension development for a long time, but like I just can't justify it. Um, I mean, there there's the one there's a Drupal extension. Um, and I think, like, I forget, uh, somebody somebody did some benchmarks, or Tag1 did some benchmarks, I think. Um, and they looked good, but it's not enough to, to justify the complexity in most cases, I think. Um, I wish I wish that was our bottleneck, because it sounds really fun. So you, so you have a process where somebody logs in, it makes two web services requests. Oh, just one? Uh-huh. Well, so I'm, I'm, I'm unclear on the process. So you log in, and then what happens? So you're authenticated locally. So a web services request is made when I press submit, okay? Sure, you're syncing with an external source. Um, so I actually did a site that was very, very similar to that, and this is where I got heavy into queues. Um, what I would do is when the I would, I would have a process that ran like every day or every two days that would actually just go through all users and sync them and just stick them in a queue and then I would just process that queue regularly just to make sure that no one was too out of date. But then if you logged in, I would immediately put a, pr a process in the queue that said go fetch this user's information and update it. And so I had, and I probably had four long running workers that were there ready to do that. Um, and so that, the queue API gives you a way to get that out of cron. In Drupal 7, and six, the only hook for queues is hook queue cron info. Um, it's unfortunate, but the queue, I think it's the queue UI module, um, came up with hook queue info, which bypasses cron. And the other hook means, it, like, I'm declaring my queue, and cron will run it automatically. So I'm sure we did it just because it's convenient, and then it just makes sure that all, all your queues get run. If you use hook queue info, um, then y it's up to you to run it. But Drush 5 supports that hook, and it has a Drush hook or Drush Q run command. So you just stick that in cron with your queue name every minute, and you're good to go. There's not a lot you can do. Nope, unfortunately. Which is why I actually like LDAP in those situations. It's a little bit faster if you can do that. But yeah, oh, sometimes you need web services. Yep. Great question. The answer is you do not have a website yet. You are making it. You are designing it. What can I do to not end up with these uh, performance issues in the future? You should do nothing. Um, you should never try to predict, I mean, within reason, there's, there are exceptions, but you should not try to predict the performance of something, and you should not try to design for performance unless it's like a critical part that you know um, 
I mean, it's useful to know big O notation in this, in this respect. So you can say if it's an O-N operation, that means I'm going to do this thing for as many other things as I need to, versus O-1 that's like an always like a hash lookup. I'm explaining that terribly. But maybe look up, look up uh, big O. Um, so there, there are some situations where you can tell, like, okay, I recognize that as like an O-N, so I'm probably going to need to fix that. But do it the simplest possible way. Then profile it. Otherwise, you end up fixing problems that you actually may not even have, right? And then you make your site more complex because you anticipated problems that you didn't actually ever prove that you had, and now you have a complex site that's hard to manage. The biggest performance problems come from complexity. And so I would always suggest, like, just do the absolute simplest thing possible and then fix performance issues as you find them. But just regularly look for them. But just always measure is, is the thing. Just don't, don't reason about what might be slow, measure and let that data tell you what's gonna, what's slow. Oh, are we done? Five minutes, okay. Um, yes. Yeah, I think, it's, I think, I have nothing against boost module. Um, if you are on a shared host where you may not have a reverse proxy and you have very cacheable pages, it's totally legit to use the boost module. Um, I've actually never used it. Yeah, I can't, I know Mike, he's a super smart guy and I respect the stuff that he does. Um, I just haven't used it. Um, but I think, I think that's just because I don't work on sites where it's an appropriate solution. Um, I think there are some invalidation issues that can come up, but yep. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, if it's it's a great option to just to just serve static HTML, but I mean, just serving that from Apache is going to be super fast. Or I mean, I, I've seen actually some pretty crazy setups with that. Um, I can't even mention who it is. It's an extremely big site. They used it to generate that, and then like they sync that and actually only serve what Boost generates. So it can be a really interesting tool. Yeah, yeah, I and mean for a lot of sites, it's it's like enabling it. So. I think that's a decent option, but if you have Varnish, if, you, if your team can handle setting up Varnish and maintaining that, I, I would prefer it. But it's, uh, I wouldn't automatically go to Varnish just because it's going to scale better because you may not ever actually need what Varnish is giving you. Okay, if there are no more questions, I think that is it. All right, thank you guys.